get started because I don't want to shorten them up, but I'm sure there may be others that come in from the other groups. But I'm Ravonna Hessel, and I'm on the board of the Northeast Leadership Forum, and so I have the opportunity to get to introduce these gentlemen. Um, this is an active uh, uh, session on active shooters. Um, unfortunately, in today's society, this is something that I think we all need to be aware of. Um, I sat in on the last session and, and automatically actually thought of a couple things that I need to go back to my chamber office and, and do. So I, I hope that uh, you will use this as just kind of a learning experience. I do want to thank um, our officers. Uh, Officer Pat O'Neill is with the city of Grapevine. Um, he's the one I originally called and then he passed the buck over to the city of Bedford. <laughs> well, I'll explain it. <laughs> got the call and I was told by my sergeant about uh, what, what was requested. I'm like, cool, I'm fine with that. I enjoy speaking. I enjoy environments like this. But at the same time, uh, my mom raised me to play strength and weaknesses. Now, my strength is pretty good. I would say an A minus when it comes to a forum like this. But when you have an A plus, for me, I do no pride here. <laughs> so, I, so, I, so I know shame. And so I'm like, look, this is his bread and butter. So I tend to play it like I'm Pippin and he's doing it. <laughs> I can score now, don't get me wrong, I can score, but if I pass it, he's, he's used to scoring. So that's how I got out of work out. So, yeah. so this is Officer Shane B from the City of Bedford Police Department, and we also have Chief Jeff Gibson here as well mm -hmm. uh, to share with you. And I'm their their bios are in the book. I'm not reading the bios, so I don't want to take away time um, that you have with them, and so I'm just going to pass it. Well, good morning, and thank you for being here. From a housekeeping standpoint, it's difficult for you to follow on the PowerPoint with the lights on. Yes. We're going to turn them off. Our hope is that with the opening of the blinds, we'll have uh, enough light for you to be able to, to, to take your notes. If this bothers anybody, just let me know, and we'll turn the lights back on. All right, so we are here today to give you simple Bible options, a simplistic approach to an increasing problem across our nation. And I want to give you some stats real quick to kind of drive home the fact that this is good information to have, and I would encourage you to pay close attention to it. Because this is a tool you're going to be able to put in your toolbox that may be the difference between life and death. Since 2000 up to today, there have been 213 active shooter situations in the United States. That breaks down to 13.3 a year and 1.1 a month. And they're increasing. They're increasing. In fact, one of the most deadliest attacks in <coughs> our country, as it applies to an active shooter, occurred this year. June 12, 2016, Orlando, Florida, where a security guard killed 49 members of a nightclub, wounded 53. Deadliest attack in U.S. history. 2016. Before that was, many of you probably remember, which was Virginia Tech in 2007, where a student killed 32 individuals and wounded 25. I want to touch on Virginia Tech just real briefly because this is a component that I want to make sure you understand in its entirety. The reason that so many people were killed at Virginia Tech was because they did exactly what they knew at the time. And those professors brought all those students into the middle of the classroom and they basically put them in what I like to refer to as a self-induced coma. They went down and they sheltered in place. So if you remember back in grade school when you had an inclement weather drill and you got underneath your desk, put your arms over your head, this is exactly what they did. This irresponsible student, the shooter at Virginia Tech, 
never shot a weapon at a target that was uh, that, that was hanging, meaning a static range, as as we would refer to it. I don't know if uh, there are any gun enthusiasts in here, but many of you can picture a gun range. You hang a target, you shoot the weapon at that target. This shooter never did that. What he did is he went to the gun range and shot all the wasted targets, all the targets that were on the ground. Never shot the gun above ground level. So when he went into Virginia Tech and started killing these people, he was shooting just like he was shooting the targets on the ground because none of those individuals moved. He didn't have to be a good shot. They were doing exactly what they knew at the time. So I encourage you as we walk through here and we talk about these three components, do not put yourself in a self-induced coma. Make sense? All right. I want to talk about two models real quickly because the Crace model is actually what's in your agenda. And the Crace model falls under the umbrella of ALERTS. And ALERT stands for Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. That's a national standard that we as Mid-Cities agencies to include Grapevine train under when we train our law enforcement officers on the response to an active shooting. And ALERT likes to use a bunch of acronyms. So CRACE stands for Civilian Response Active Shooter Event, more commonly referred to Avoid, Deny, Defend. That's one model. The second model is Run Homeland Security. It's Run, Hide, Fight. Same exact concepts and principles. So we like to take this simplistic approach to everything, mainly because when you are put into a stress-induced situation, what do you remember? the most simplistic things. The more complex that we make it, the more you're going to forget. So today we're going to talk about run, hide, fight. We're going to keep it simple. All right, so the stats that I gave you were not in an effort to alarm you. They were in an effort to make sure that we solidify the information that we're going to discuss in the next hour is data that you need, unfortunately, in today's culture, all right? I'm not trying to scare you. And I want to also make sure that I'm very clear. What myself and Shane are telling you are not absolutes. These are just tools to go in your toolbox to assist you while you're in a normal, lucid environment, while you can process this information. Not when you're in that stressed and do situation where you have to think. What our goal here is to remove the thought process altogether. In law enforcement, our officers have milliseconds to make decisions. That's why our training is so critical. We train our officers to react to those millisecond scenarios during training. We don't want them to think in that millisecond scenario because what happens at that point? It's too late and they're dead. And we're doing the same, the, the same philosophy in place true with you. If you have to sit there and think, it could be the difference between your life or death. Okay? So we're just trying to give you a good platform, a good common denominator to work from, so that you don't have to think, you can act in the most simplistic approach uh, as possible. That's being prepared, as simple as it can be. All right. We have a uh, physiological and a psychological response to every action or everything that's presented to us. And our response is one or two things. We're either going to fight or we're going to run. But nowhere in there does it say go into a self-induced coma. Nowhere in there does it say go into the tragedy of Virginia Tech and what caused those students to be killed. I'm not passing the blame. That's a learning experience for, for us. But you can't go and curl up in a ball on the ground and pray that it's going to go away because it's not going away. That's going to cost you your life. So don't do it. Stick to these three concepts and principles that we're going to talk about today. You have a higher probability for success. 
All right, my name is Trey Bing, as she, as she said. Um, I'm with City of Bedford, and uh, as, as Pat had said, we work together because we're part of what's called the Northeast Tarrant County Area SWAT Team. So four cities got together and created one regional SWAT unit, and he and I are on that unit, and that's how he and I know each other. And uh, I've also, I've been teaching to law enforcement officers the ALERT model, the active shooter response for since 05, I believe. And uh, Pat and I went over to his agency and taught all his people um, and grapevine the same thing. So as the chief said, all of the police departments are on the same playing field, if you will. We use the same tactics, we respond the same way. And that's because we may have to work together someday. So we, we thought, you know, while we're doing this with the law enforcement officers, it might be a good idea to tell some people out in the real world, you know, this is how you <coughs> Because obviously you can't do things that we're going to be able to do because you don't have the equipment to do the things that we do. So um, before I get started, to, to kind of help get people to realize maybe I do need to think about some stuff, my question to you first off is how many people by a show of hands work in an office, an office building, okay? Of all your hands are up, for, for those who don't, do you work out in the field somewhere or where do you work? In a classroom or anybody? Like back here, do you don't work in an office? Well, classroom. Classrooms. Um, even y'all included, how many of you classroom, office, outside, in a car like we do, how many of you have two plans that are dedicated strictly to somebody coming in and trying to shoot you? You do? Two plans? How many of you of the individual have one? One? Okay, so three people, four maybe, in this room with these people. That tells us the vast majority of people have don't have no plan. Well, the last time you want to, or the last moment that you want to be thinking of your plan is when it's happening to you. Because if you think you're going to come up with a good plan when it's happening to you, Probably not. That's when you go into that self-induced coma like the chief was talking about. That's when you freeze and go, I don't know what to do. So what we're doing is we're trying to, we're trying to give you vital options to consider. This is not the end all be all. This is not the way it's gonna be if you don't follow steps one through three. If you don't do it exactly like I tell you that you're gonna die, that's not what we're saying. What we're doing is by the show of hands that shows you the majority of people don't have a plan, the majority of people don't think about it, it shows that the majority of people aren't prepared. And so we just want you to kind of get, get the wheels turned in your head, get prepared, think of something. We want to make this muscle memory. Law enforcement use a lot of use all different weird terminologies and stuff, and we use muscle memory as one big one, and OODA loop is an acronym we use as another. Does anybody know what muscle memory is? When I refer to that, it's basically an automatic reaction. Here's a good example. If you're driving down the freeway, a car stops in front of you real fast, what do you do? <laughs> Did, now think about this, you, you hit the brakes, right? Did you actually go, I see red lights. Oh, those are tail lights. I'm going faster, oh, let me take my foot off the gas. Let me put, do you think about it? <laughs> no, what happens? You immediately react. You react in a situation, don't think about it. That's because it's muscle memory. There's no other way for you to react except for hitting the brakes. And you know it, you don't have to think about it. You could be in a crazy state of mind and you know you're gonna hit the brakes. Well, that's what we want you to hear. We want you to have that plan ready to roll with this ever, God forbid, happens to you or a place that you're at. <coughs> you're hitting the brakes, if that makes any sense. Now, we talk about OODA loops. OODA loops is an acronym. It's, it's O-D-A. Basically, what OODA loop is, is everyone has it. Everybody does it every day. Everything you do, your OODA loop is involved. So, for example, I'll talk about when you guys walked in this door. First of all, you had to observe the door. You observed it. Now, you had to orient yourself so you could pass through it. Then you had to make the, the, uh, the decision D to go in, and then you had to actually make it happen, right? So you observe, you orient yourself, you decide you're going to do it, and then you act. Well, in a stress-induced environment, your OODA loop never gets to the act part. You orient yourself, and you say, oh, that's wrong, you reorient. Then you orient yourself, oh, that's wrong. Then you might get to decide, okay, I'm going to do this, and then you don't act. We, we want you to have that muscle memory so there's no continuous loop and cycle through the OODA loop in your mind that you break that and you get through and you make things happen. So, um, like I said, we're going to talk about some stuff that's not rocket science. It's it's pretty darn simple. You're probably going to go, what do you mean? That's it? I mean, you already kind of saw it. It's not, we're not giving you anything that's amazing, all this new high-tech stuff. This is very simple stuff, but as we have already seen, we don't have any plans in here. It's something you think about. So, I'm going to start off by reading to you out loud, if you all just follow with me in your head, um, the definition of Homeland Security uh, it's pretty long, it's about four slides long, and we'll talk about a couple things on it. So according to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, an active shooter is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. In most cases, active shooters use firearms and there is no pattern or method to their selection of victims. 
Active shooter situations are unpredictable and they evolve quickly. Key points here, they're fast. The people doing this have to be fast. They know they have to be quick. So obviously the best way to do that from a distance and up close and make things happen fast by hurting people is with a firearm. You're never going to be able to predict where they go or what they're going to do. That's why we need more than one plan. Because you may have one plan, but if you can't predict that they're not going to interrupt that plan, what are you going to do if they do? you got to make sure you have that. So it's never predictable, so always be prepared. Typically, the immediate deployment of law enforcement is required to stop the shooting and mitigate harm to victims. Because active shooter situations are often over within 10 to 15 minutes before law enforcement arrives, individuals must be prepared both mentally and physically to deal with the situation. So let me talk about the 10 to 15 minute thing. If we're in this room and way down the other end of the building, in this building, we hear a bang. Not everyone automatically assumes a bang means a gunshot, right? It could be a student walking down the hallway, they drop their book. You ever take a big heavy book and drop it on a tile? It makes a pretty good sized bang. So if a bang happens, one person gets shot. Now all of us that heard it, we kind of were probably going to ignore it, that bang, we hear another one. Now we're thinking, That's, that sounds weird. All the while, things are happening, right? People are getting shot, things are happening bad, and we're still sitting here trying to process what's going on. Now we hear another bang. Now we know something's not right. So now, right now, we're thinking, okay, what are we going to do? Hopefully we're not thinking, what are we going to do? Hopefully we're doing what we know to do because we plan for it. But this is all time, so now we think, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Now we act on it. We orient ourselves, we decide, and we act. All of that process takes time. Meanwhile, while all this is occurring, the police haven't been called yet. So now the police are finally called. Now they give to our dispatchers. Our dispatchers have to collect the information, find out where they're at, find out what's going on, because they need information to give to us because we're the ones coming. So now they finally get the information. Hopefully, we're not all on calls and that we're available. Now they have to dispatch. An officer has to receive the call. Now they have to drive here. So you can see how all this time elapses. That's why when we say often before law enforcement arrives, there could be 10 or 15 minutes before, honestly, a, a person, an officer is even notified or in route to the call. So because of this, you've got to be prepared because that 10 or 15 minutes is all you've got to make sure that you're safe. And we're probably not going to be here within that from the very first second it goes off within that time because they happen so quick. An active shooter is a person who is often motivated by revenge and is determined to, hit, to cause disruptive fear, mass casualties, and death. In such a scenario, there is no reasoning or bargaining with the perpetrator. The biggest thing to take away from this part of it, I don't care if you've worked with a person for 35 years, 25 years, 100 years, that person typically will end. If, they, if I decide to be an active shooter, how's it probably going to end? What's, how, how, how do I get dealt with more than likely in most cases? What happens to me? I get killed. Who kills me? Myself, right? So if I've given up on myself and I don't care about me, what makes me think I care about you? It doesn't matter how long you know me. I've already committed suicide before I walked in that building. I knew what was going to happen. I'm going to go in this building. I'm going to kill as many people as I can, then I'm going to kill myself. So if you're just a body in front of me and I haven't started, but you're pleading and you're saying, hey, what do you stop? No, what are you doing? Think about it. I'm probably going to get activated and just go, oop, there's my first one, and then move on to the next one. Don't be a victim. Don't put yourself in a position to be the victim. There's no reasoning and no bargaining. You're not going to do it. I promise you, don't even try it. Get away. Okay? And lastly, in such a scenario, the focus of law enforcement is dedicated to rapid response and immediate action rapid deployment. We're the closest officers are the ones who take immediate and direct action against the shooter. The bottom line is that if you wish to survive an active shooter incident, you must develop your own prevention and preparation and survival skills. These skills can be learned and they may make a difference as to whether you live or die. So I say that to tell you this. Here's the rocket science that we're telling you to do. Run, hide, and fight. It's that super simple. And I'm going to talk about each individual one, but seriously, it's that simple. Run, hide, fight. That's what we want you to think. And we're going to go through a step here. So. And by the way, guys, we kind of are short on time, so I have to speed through this. Please ask questions if you have questions. I'd rather ask your questions and finish the PowerPoint, to be quite honest, because we can get all the information to the PowerPoint, from the PowerPoint to you. So ask questions if you have them as we go. Again, we want you to run. If you see that there's the bad guy way over there, and my escape route, because I have a plan, is way over here, I'm taking my escape route. I'm running. I'm getting out. Know your office, know your surroundings. But when you're at the church, when you're at the mall, when you're at the movie theater, at the library, at a friend's house, it doesn't matter where you are, always be vigilant. Know your surroundings, know your escape paths. Know where you can get out and get away. Always attempt to evacuate. Don't hesitate. Leave. Get out. If you can't, or when you're evacuated, 
If you can pull somebody else out and help them, please do that. Try to help these people. Try to push them out and get them away. But don't let somebody's indecision or somebody's hesitation cost you your life. Here's what I mean. If you're trying to pull me out, yes, sir. All right, this feels very counterintuitive as, as a teacher. I feel responsible for my students, mm -hmm. and I feel like I can't uh, abandon them yep. in, a, in that sort of situation. And I, and I completely agree with you, and you, like us, have a job who also feels the same way you do is nurses, doctors, sure. things like that with patients. Here's what I'm telling you. If you can get away and you can lay your head down at night, then do what you got to do. We're not telling you you have to. This is the one time that we say this is okay to be selfish because the potential exists, a very high probability, if you're not selfish, you will die. It's that simple. Now, if you feel obligated like we do as police, that our lives aren't as worth as much as everybody else's per se, we're here to lay down our life for somebody else that we don't know. That's what we feel, that's what you feel like kids. That's what a doctor or nurse may feel about their patients. I'm not going to argue with that because I do it. I go with that mindset every day. So I can please see what you're saying. I'm not telling you to abandon your students by any means whatsoever. But just something you have to think about. Think about how, what you view and how and, and where your level of importance is with certain people. And if your life is worth theirs, then, then stay with them, pull them out. The bottom line is I'm telling you, if you can get out, get out. If you don't feel that obligation, if you feel like you can lay your head down at night, then just uh, that you're gonna have the opportunity to lay your head down at night, get away. Does that make sense? It sounds harsh, but the reality is that's what it is. Sean, something that will help him is you can think about this as in your classroom, which is, is the immediate thing, thing that you're thinking about. But if you're in a movie theater right. and you're, you know, your kids are next to you and that there's all strangers around you, that, that's also a situation you could be this, in. Where, this applies to any environment you're in, whether it's here, whether it's school, whether it's in an airport, if it's at Kroger. This, is, this can apply to you anywhere. That's why I say vigilance, being aware of your surroundings. Um, not just your place of work, yes. One of the ways, and I haven't been there, hopefully I never have been, but I've gotten around that a little bit, and I hope that my muscle memory will kick in. We have been trained at the hospital to leave that patient because mm -hmm. the officers can't get there until someone calls the officers. If I have a clear path, then what I've decided I'm going to do is to take that path so I can get outside and I can get my help when I need to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. I don't know how I'll live with myself later. And I'm a former age care for three children. But I, I keep thinking about the greater picture. If I have a clear path to get out to get help, to me, that's the way I feel right. the most. And, and like I said, this is not an absolute it's no. a decision you have to make. The bottom line is once you have a plan. So if you can get away, get away. We want you to go help others escape if you can. If you if you can't and they're indecisive and they're not they're not moving, leave them there and get them out. Encourage them to leave both you if you can. Once you get out of the place, because remember, there's nothing interfering with you and your exit plan or your exit or your evacuation. But once you get out, call 911. We need you to call us immediately as soon as possible because we need to notify. We need to notify. Them. Don't stand at your desk and do it because if you stand at your desk and do it and you get shot, did you actually make notification? You didn't do it, you were no good, you were no good for that notification. So get away, separate yourself, get to a safe place and call us. Pretty simple, right? You see, you see the problem, you see an avenue of escape, take it, get away, run. If you can, because between you and your plans, plans, I say plural, between you and your plan uh, exit routes, you see bad guys. Which meaning you can't get out that way and you're stuck. But they don't see you, we don't want you to run at them because that's not gonna be a good thing. We want you to hide. Do your best to hide. Get into an office, a closet, somewhere safe. Lock and barricade that door. If this person hasn't seen you, they don't know you're there, don't advertise yourself as a victim. Get in that room, lock the door, barricade it, cabinets, chairs, desks, whatever you can think to throw in front of the door, we want you to, to put throw, throw, throw in front of the door. Make it so they can't get in. If you can't get into a room, find cabinets, find something that conceals your space, or that conceals your body so they don't know you're there. Think about an active shooter as a lion in, a, in, a, in a, an African or pride, or not pride, in a prairie. If he's hungry, he's going to go after the first thing he sees moving because that's food to him. He's got to go attack it. These guys don't have time, and gals, if they're already, that are, are going to do this kind of stuff. They don't have time to pick who they're going to hurt. They, are, they know they're just going to come hurt people. So they're going to take the path of least resistance. They're not going to try to breach a door and spend all their time trying to get into a room if they think they may have hurt something in there because we're coming. They know that we're en route and they know they're going to have to deal with us in a second. If we get there before they affect their vengeance, 
and their goal wasn't complete, they're not going to do that. They're going to bypass blockades and barricades and things like that. So get in a room and barricade yourself. Hide. Get out of their sight. If they don't see you, they don't know you're there, out of sight, out of mind. They're probably going to bypass it. Um, like I said, hard behind, hide behind large objects, and then once you get to your safe spot, you're hiding. Remain very, very quiet. Don't make noise. Turn off cell phones. Turn off lights. Um, if you've got radio on, t computer, TV, whatever the case, if you can turn it off, turn it off. No noise. Because if you make noise, that's going to attract the person. If they have nothing to do, they don't see anybody out there, and they hear noise coming from them, they're probably going to try that door. Don't attract the attention. Be quiet. Moving on. You can't run, or I'm sorry, if you can run, you, and there's no way between your exit path, in front of your exit path and that exit, get out, get out. If between you and the exit is a bad guy, and he hasn't seen you, you've got to hide, secure yourself. If you can't get out, because between you and the exit is the bad guy, and you two are staring at each other, or he finds you, we want you to fight. And I'm not talking about toe-to-toe, -to -toe, bobbing and weaving. <laughs> We, we want you to do everything you possibly can to incapacitate this person. We're not asking you to finish him off, to make sure you kill him so he can't. We're asking you to do what you can to incapacitate that individual so he can no longer inflict violence on you. If you give yourself a split second by hitting him in the head with something and he falls to the ground and he still has that gun, that's your moment to run. Get out of there. Don't try to finish him off because he may be bigger, stronger, or more athletic, may have better weapons proficiency than you, and if you go to fight for a gun or something like that, he may pull it on you and then you're hurt, you're shot. <coughs> we want you to make sure that you use everything you can. And, and, and think about this, how many people carry a firearm in here right now, anybody? So the only weapons in here are the police, are the police officers, right? Besides our weapons, how many weapons are in this room? What? All kinds of stuff. <laughs> change everywhere just because it changes just because they allow it and everything happens. Um, so and he, everything in this room is a potential weapon. So use these things to your advantage. Pick up chairs, picture frames, podiums, whatever you can do to incapacitate that person. We want you to fight for your life. Don't become a victim. If I can tell you this, if somebody's coming after me and all I have is a chair, I'm gonna be leaving some damage before I get killed. They're not gonna take me easy. So don't let that be you. Don't get taken easy. Fight for your life and for each other. Here's an interesting statistic. 66.9% of all active shooters end prior to law enforcement arriving. But here's where the fear comes into play with this statistic. Up prior to 2015, it used to be in the 90% range meaning 90% of active shooter situations were over by the time law enforcement arrived. So from the start of 2015 to date, our active shooter situations are lasting longer. The Orlando, Florida scenario that I provided you down in this Indian in US history lasted a troublesome amount of time for law enforcement to get in there. So I tell you that to once again drive home and solidify with this very simple, very elementary three steps that we're educating you on today, just how critical these three steps are in your preparedness and planning stage in a normal lucid environment, which is where you're at today. All right, let's move forward into a safe place. Uh, now, Shane had mentioned, uh, and uh, I think we just talked about as well, this is not specific to your workplace. This is your place of worship. This is out to dinner with your loved ones, your family, your friends, your colleagues. This is the movie theater. This is any location, a grocery store. Wherever you go, you should be aware of your surroundings and at least know an exit strategy. Right? You may not know hiding places inside locations you've never been to before, but you know how to get out. Or if you're in a grocery store, you know you can at least get behind an aisle. So all these things 
are things that we have to process as we go into these locations. And it should just become second nature. Where do I need to go to, to be somewhat set? All right, so not all of these are going to be applicable for these unknown locations, but what I'd like for you to do is concentrate on your workplace, and then you understand that going to the unknowns, maybe you go to the same grocery store. Obviously, you go to your probably your same place of worship every week. Things of that nature. Uh, get a plan in place. But for the unknown, use these as components to make your decision when you walk into those areas. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, do you have an office with an exterior window? Well, as long as you're not on the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth floor, <laughs> that would be a good strategy location that you can breach that window with some type of object inside there. Remember, your life depends on getting out, so there's probably a high probability you're going to be able to break that glass and, and, and get out. Uh, most of us have offices now that all have electronic access, so we have little card readers. So this is good in the sense that if the individual is an employee, they may have access to, to that door. So that would be a negative consequences consequence of that electronic reader. But even if you did have an employee that had access to that office through that electronic, do something to barricade that door in excess of just your lock. Now, if you have the good old fashioned key lock, and you don't have the ability to lock it inside, I would encourage you to review that. Get, get, uh, get your maintenance individuals or, or somebody that does uh, uh, building, um, building maintenance to see if there's a possibility that you can lock your office door from the interior portion of it to keep you safe inside in that hiding component. If not, use something to barricade that door closed. All right, we talked about the Virginia Tech situation and how all of those students were killed. If an active shooter came in this room, we would not all converse in the center of this room, right? We would immediately spread out. First of all, we're doing one thing, and Shane alluded to the OODA loop, and we are affecting that shooter's OODA loop too because they have to now track every single one of us and then orient to who they want to shoot and then make that act. Meanwhile, what are we doing? We have not only spread out, but we're taking weapons, whether it be chairs, and all of us are doing that, trying to disturb that individual enough that we can make an exit out of that door. Everybody follow? But what we're not doing is all coming together because now we, we follow the principle of what, what occurred in Virginia Tech. Spread out. It is much more difficult to hit a moving target than it is a static target. And the static target means static, not moving, not mobile. Once you get into a hiding location, this could be your office, this could be someplace you may have turned a corner and seen an open room or, or open office, and you've locked it. We talked a, a, a little bit about barricading that, whatever you need to do to get that door secured is what you're gonna do. If that's moving tables, uh, if, if that's finding heavy objects that, that you can physically move over there, you're going to do that. You're gonna close the shades, you're gonna turn the lights off. You are just making yourself as small and as quiet as possible. Small and quiet are the two components that we're looking for here. All right? I want to touch on glass. Everybody knows that a bullet can go through glass, right? But if I shut those blinds, that individual cannot see me. That is called concealment. We are concealing ourselves. And the comfort for you is, and this is statistically proven from the individuals that we've had the opportunity to take in custody post an active shooter situation. They find pleasure, based upon the definition that Shane went to, they find pleasure in seeing the victim's hurt. So if they can't see, and they're randomly shooting through walls and glass, there's a high likelihood that's not gonna happen. 
because they're not achieving the pleasure that they are looking for in this situation. Does that make sense? So there is comfort to know that if all I had was glass, that I still have a high probability of surviving that if I can just get that closed and separate myself from eyesight. True value in that. So uh, remember that. All right. Keep quiet. And most importantly, don't answer the door. Here's an interesting fact. Law enforcement has a key to every single one of your offices. We have a key to every single one of your buildings. You're not going to keep us out. And A, that's good because you eventually want to be rescued. But here is why you are not going to answer the door. Merrick Griffin and I are good friends. He's in his office. I go to his door. I knock on his door. I say, Mayor, it's Jeff. Open the door. He's not opening that door. Unbeknownst to the mayor, I've got a gun to my head. Now, he has subjected himself to being a victim, and anybody else who may have ran into his office in a hiding location. We're going to get you out. Trust us. Don't answer the door. Don't answer the door from one of your friends. Don't do it. You subject yourself to a higher probability of less desirable results. Let us take care of you. It may take some time, but you're still alive. And that's what our goal is. We talked about spreading out. Everybody understands the objectives of why we do not want to stay as a tight-knit group. We want, to be, we want to be moving and mobile. We want to get on the floor or get behind furniture. Again, all we're looking for is a concealment so that individual cannot see. Active shooters can take the path of least resistance. They want to kill as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time because they know it's inevitable that we are showing up. And when we show up, two things are going to happen. They're going to kill themselves or we're going to neutralize them. So anything we can do in the quickest manner possible so that you don't have line of sight is, gonna, is going to uh, save your life. And just follow what we tell you to do. Don't do anything. If you're in a hiding location, don't do anything. We're, we're going to walk you through. We're going to hold your hand. We understand this is probably one of the most difficult situations you've ever been, into, been involved in in your entire life. We're going to take care of you. Just listen. We like to use the saying, comply, comply. You may not agree with what we're doing, just comply with us. You can complain to me later. <laughs> All right, once we get into a safe location, call 911. Don't care if your friends say, hey, I'm calling 911. Don't assume. Everybody call 911. If we flood our 911 phone lines, that's fine. At least we are notified and we've got the appropriate resources on the way to take care of you, your colleagues, and your friends. All right. Dad, intelligence, what did you see? How many people did you see? Was something specific about their clothing? Because here's the challenge for us. If the three of us respond to Tarrant County College and there is nothing driving us, we don't hear anything, we want to direct our resources to the appropriate place in the quickest manner possible, and that intelligence is what you're giving us. Does everybody follow me when I, when I say that? Because if, if we're not driven to the sound of gunfire, we're going to start, start a slow and methodical search, which is going to take 15 to 18 hours on a location this, this large, depending on how many law enforcement officers we can get in. All right, so what you saw is very, very critical. How many shooters were there? That's good intel to know. All right, what type of weapons? Not a make, model, caliber. Was it small? Was it big? All right, was it small or was it big? That's just good data for us as we're making entry into, into, into these facilities. Any kind of intelligence you can give us to direct our resources is a benefit. So anything that you capture, make sure you're sharing that. So when you call on number one, those telecommunicators are, are answering your phone call. And we ask, where are you at? Well, what if you walked into a grocery store for the first time and you're hiding in the closet and you've never been there? We 
we have also taken a reasonable mistake. We're going to find you. That store is going to be searched. You're guaranteed that you're going to be found. But if you're in a common location, if you're in your office at your place of business, let us know. I'm in, I'm in my office. Give that information to our telecommunicators. What this does is it allows us to step in the right direction for accountability. Because we're going to have to start finding supervisors and find out who is, who is at work today and start going through that accountability chain. Make sense? All right. All right, real quick, I'm going to clarify something to make sure all everybody knows what you're talking about. When the chief says we have keys, we actually put have keys in the police station. Everybody's <laughs> Every single room, every single building in your house, as a matter of fact, you have keys to go That's actually not true. He, what he means is, is he promises you, and I promise you too, we have the tools and the equipment to get anywhere we need to be. So don't answer the door in a situation like that because if you're locked in and you're barricaded, I promise you, worst case scenario, we got trucks that can drive through walls. So don't, so don't worry about that. So that's what it means by key. So we're not going to sneak in your house at night. We're not going to be in your house. We're not going to be All right, so when we arrive, this is very important. We're going to talk about this because, like I said, it's extremely important. Remain calm. Don't freak out. I'm probably, that's going to fall on deaf ears when that actually happens to you. But if you can control yourself and contain your excitement, that excitement, that really helps you and us. Because what we're going to be doing is by screaming directions at you guys saying, hey, do this, do that. And if you don't comply with us, what does that tell you? Or me, rather. If I'm saying, if I have a gun pointed at you and you knew, because you, you guys called and y'all were in this situation, you knew that I'm here to stop the bad guy who's shooting people, and my gun's pointed at you, and I say, do X, Y, and Z, and you do A, B, and C, what does that tell me about you? You might be a bad guy. Yeah. So I might have to handle up on you a little bit to make sure that you don't hurt anybody else. So comply with us, listen to exactly what we tell you, and then everything will flow smoothly. Plus what we'll do is make everybody get out quicker. If we're, if we're wasting time trying to get people under control that aren't listening to us, what that's doing effectively is making the evacuation slow, making it so we can't get people out in an expeditious fashion like we would like to. So comply with us. Let us know that you aren't the bad guy. For those of you that carry, if you're in a mall, a grocery store, like we gave you other examples, for those of you with LTC, the license to carry, if you have that, remember this. We don't know you. You guys don't know me, right? If I was a civilian clothes, you wouldn't have any idea I was a police officer, right? Well, I don't know you and you don't know me. So if I'm coming to a location that's an active shooter event, and I don't have good intel on the suspect. Here's my example really quickly. Whenever you hear about these news stories about the, the people, the, the suspects rather, in these shootings, how many times out of 10 does it end up being what they say the first time? Almost never. I mean, you look at the thing that happened in San Bernardino, they had like four suspects that were chasing with two people. They had three, four different descriptions. So we're gonna do what we can to hopefully trust the intel and trust the info, but that doesn't mean it's absolute, and we know that. So what I, my point is, if you do carry and you want to protect yourself, that's kind of what it's for, for personal protection, do that. But understand, be vigilant, know if you can where we are because we might give you a command. And if you don't listen, you don't comply, what do you think may happen? Because I don't know who you are and there's no way for me to know. So be vigilant, wear your surroundings, protect yourself. I wouldn't suggest being the rogue guy going after the person and trying to neutralize the situation. Get yourself out because you never know where an officer might turn a corner. And if that's what we see, we have to act. And I just, so does everybody get where I'm going with that? Yes. If, if you protect yourself, please protect yourself. But don't go out and be the hero because we, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt innocent people. And if you're going to go attack the bad guy, I don't want to make that mistake. So comply, listen to what we tell you. Follow directions. So if I'm telling you to walk out, hands up, palms facing me, and, or hands on your face, whatever I'm telling you, do that. Make sure you listen to what we're telling you to do. If you're in a barricaded situation where you're in a room where you've barricaded and you have basic first aid, please start applying that to the people that may be hurt. Because as the chief just said, if we run into a situation like this campus, you know how many police officers it's going to take to search every hole and nook and cranny in this campus? And we're going to do that. We're probably going to keep you guys in your barricaded situation until we know there's no more bad guys. Because if I just randomly start pulling people out of rooms just to get you out of here and I haven't gotten the bad guy, what am I doing? I'm creating more victims potentially, right? So I'm saying, okay, get out. It's okay. Go this way. We're here. 
Just because we're here doesn't mean you're absolutely safe. We gotta find the bad guy first. So you may be in that location for a long time. It takes less than three minutes for the body to bleed out, I believe. I mean, doctors here, correct me if I'm wrong. Femoral artery, you hit that, you're gonna bleed the quickest right there. So you don't have time to wait for 20 minutes, two hours, 10 hours. If you have the ability to provide basic first aid to your, uh, to your friends and family and those that you work with to do that. You are in a crime scene, understand this. We don't wanna, we're, we're going to talk to you about what you observed again because when we neutralize the threat and everything becomes safe, we have to now go back and start over. Why did this happen? Who is this person? Where did they come from? What did they get? What did you see? We may have to ask you to relive that scenario by giving us information. We're not doing it because we want you to be re-victimizing. So we're not trying to put this in your memory forever. We just have to know these things because sometimes you find information that leads you to show that somebody else may be planning a similar event. So remember that. You're in a crime scene. We are going to speak to you at a, maybe at a later, maybe not right then, but maybe at a later date. Also understand that the building itself, this room, if it happened here, this would be a crime scene. So just be aware of things like that too. Things that we have to that we have to work. <clears throat> Always be aware of your surroundings. Remember that. That's the key to this. Always be aware of your surroundings. Always, 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 if you can, come up with a plan in your workspace, in your home, if you have a restaurant you go to frequently, think about ways you can evacuate to get you and your family out safely. We want you to have this as a memory marker to start thinking about it. We're not saying this is the end all be all, like I already told you in the beginning. We're not saying that if you jump steps, you're gonna, you're gonna lose and you're doing it wrong. We want the wheels in your head to start turning. We want you to really start thinking about, what am I gonna do if, and well, I never thought about that. What would I do if this happened? And I hope that that's what is, is going on in your head right now. There's no perfect plan, but it's better to have a bad plan than no plan, right? So we want you to start thinking. So know your surroundings, know all that kind of stuff. Know what to do in case of emergency. Know where how to exit your uh, building or current position and do not panic and remain calm. Are there, I, I went through this quickly because we kind of went long in the last class. I want to make sure we got it on the end. Um, I'm almost going along now. If there are any questions, please ask questions because really, truly, the more you guys ask of us, the better for y'all. And we're going to show you a video here in a second that really drives this home. But uh, we, we want you guys to ask questions too because it helps you think about your scenarios better as well. So, no questions? How yes. close are we to being a test on one calls? I think we can't really have that on there. Are quiet? We don't want to talk? So like, no. are we, we don't have that yet? No, we do not. Oh, okay. I thought we did that. So, it would be unfair for me to give you a time parameter. However, it is something that, that we that is in preliminary discussions now. Uh, fairness to you, I, I don't know that it will move forward with it or not, but we are discussing about the pros and cons of that uh, new, new app. I would, the other thing I'd say is, you know, we've got great community police officers and a lot of a lot of us meet them on a regular basis, and um, I have every time I meet one and, and you know get to know somebody. Today, Pat gave me his cell number. You know, I keep that and I keep it under police in my phone. Um, and I have been known. I mean, our chief. I've been known to send a text to to my chief at one point in time because of a, an issue that was happening. And, and so you know, get to know your officers because they do have cell phones and, and they're great at, at being you know communicating with us. So. Um, while the system may not have it, I mean, we have great community police officers that I think will, you know, if you need them, they're there. Do you, you work at HUB? Sorry, you work at HUB Hospital? I do. That's like, you don't recognize from somebody. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. If you call 911 and you can't say anything, can they find you? Yes. Yes, it's uh, not, not on, oh, on a cell phone. Yeah, uh, there are very few occasions where it might bounce off another tower. We'll have to do a little investigation. But yes, you can do a tracker. With the exception of a couple, of, there are two providers out there that we cannot track. Uh, I hate to tell those to you because my memory has just failed me, but there, there are two providers that, that we can, cannot track and they are Go, go phones. Go phones. Go phones. And I apologize. Go. But even those go phones that you buy have to have a provider, like ATT, Sprint, and uh, my memory is failing me. 
So there, there's different routes we can go with that too. We can ping phones. And that actually pinging phone is the best way because it can show us within so many feet of where your location is. But to answer your question about that, yeah, absolutely. You just that goes, that right there goes for any situation you're in. If you're in your home and you think somebody broke into it and you don't want to make noise, 911, leave your phone there. Because we're coming no matter what. And we, we might not know why, but we're going to be coming. So this, if you can't speak, 911, if you can't put the volume down on the phone, so the dispatcher yelling at you, hey, hello, <laughs> then they don't hear that. But yeah, 911, leave it there. We'll, we'll know. And, and plus, it has to be on for us to, to ping it as close, as, like to get, to get the best ping we can, it's better if it's on and if it's actually you using the city. So, any, any other questions? Because, well, like I said, after this, I think um, that one. That basically says, like I said, we're not here to tell you how to save your life. We're not here to tell you that it's, that's the way it is. There's no other way around it. Run Night Fight is just a viable option for you to consider to get the wheels turning in your head and think about what am I going to do in my life and wherever I, wherever I find myself the most. What am I going to do in any case this happens? So this video that I'm going to show you is uh, it really brings home what we're talking about. It gives you a visual representation of the well. It kind of puts a little bit of reality into it. And so please, after this, if we have time, which we may not, if we, but if we do, we'll uh, answer any questions. So any questions for our <coughs> Our contact information is going to be on this next slide after the video. I would just encourage you to write it down, take a photo of it, whatever you need. Uh, because Shane and I will be more than willing to assist you outside of this class uh, with any of your specific issues that you may have that you're not willing to present in open forum. Uh, calls will help you. Doesn't matter where you're at. We'll, we'll still take care of you. It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you're out of the line of fire, Try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911.
try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm.